We are thrilled and honored to have this film being previewed here tonight. And have Nat take over, and he's going to talk a little bit about the film. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for coming. It's great to see so many familiar faces and old friends of mine and old friends of Ray's and Jody's. Um, the origin of this film was just about a year ago when uh, Ray had just recovered from, uh, what do you call that kind of surgery? A tatter, aortic valve replacement. Heart surgery. Heart surgery. Heart surgery. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he had just gotten back from rehab. Uh, it was a little touch and go there for a couple weeks before and immediately after the surgery. But uh, as Ray is wont to do, he pulled through uh, and has been doing well ever since. Um, and right when he got back from rehab, uh, he called me. We've known each other for 35 years or so uh, and asked if I would consider doing an audio tape of him recounting his life, which he had done with his mom when she was close to the end of her life. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, Ray, uh, I'm a bit of a videographer. By the way, my background is my first lifetime, I was uh, a newspaper publisher at Vanguard Press and Vermont Times up in Chittenden County, but living here. Um, and then after that, I became a budding filmmaker. I actually went to film school after college, uh, but wasn't able to get a TV job in Vermont, so <laughs> I became a journalist. Um, and I was also executive producer of the Vermont movie, which Paul Carnahan back there and others may be familiar with. Uh, Nora Jacobson was the lead filmmaker, and three dozen Vermont film. Anyway, that's another story. Uh, so I have been working on this for, the, the filming took about a month and a half, nine separate interviews. I thought it was going to be, uh, you know, a pretty quick and easy uh, project. But it took on a life of its own. Ray's a great uh, raconteur. So one thing led to the other, and pretty soon I was a little bit over my head. <laughs> uh, and then it took about, uh, I had about six and a half hours worth of interviews, nine different interviews. And uh, right now it's at uh, an hour and 21 minutes. Um, so the editing process, as is typical, I was spending about a half a day a week on average uh, for nine, 10 months over at the Orca studio. Thank you, Orca. Mm -hmm. It's a great resource for this community. Um, and uh, was editing with some help from my grandson, Desmond, who's operating my laptop here. <laughs> it's going to be 18 in about a month and a half. Um, and the folks at Orca were helping up until about three hours ago. <laughs> uh, so you may notice a minor glitch or two, but it's in pretty good shape. Overall, I'm happy with it. Uh, it's not a Ken Burnsian style documentary. There's not very much in the way of B-roll or interviewing other people. The only people I interviewed were Ray and Jody. So it's basically an hour and 20 minutes of talking heads uh, and photographs and artwork and a couple of other things thrown in there. So that's all. There'll be a Q&A afterwards that Ray and Jody, if you have questions for her, will participate in. And uh, enjoy.
my first memories of life are actually uh, of my younger brother being brought home from the hospital and he was born in 1945 and uh, Roosevelt uh, had just died so it was sort of a mixed it was nice for my mother to get home from the hospital with a new baby brother and also we were mourning the death of uh, a, a loved president. Uh, I myself wasn't too thrilled about having a younger brother but I didn't have much say about it so I had to learn to live with it. And my younger brother and I, after 30 years of life, finally got to be good friends. We lived in uh, Brookline, Mass, in a residential neighborhood, in a house that my father had built at the same time as he built his first gas station back about 1925. Dad was, uh, was involved in politics. He was 17 years, he was chairman of the school committee in Brookline, and then he was elected to the selectmen, and he was chairman of the board of selectmen for something like 20 years. And that was what he was really interested in, was government, and uh, that's how we lived, it was with him going off to a meeting, which was okay, you know. I don't know how my mother felt about it, she never complained about it. I think she liked the uh, prestige of it all. She liked being married to the head honcho. She was a great wife of a politician. She could throw a party and uh, she liked people. My mother was uh, tough to get close to. Uh, she was very opinionated and uh, you did it her way or it wasn't right. My father, he loved us and did everything for us, but he wasn't able to really express any kind of uh, feelings or uh, or understanding about what we as individual kids were were about. But that, they weren't bad parents, they were good parents. But I can tell you about my uh, my grandmother uh, Crow. Her name was Honora. We called her Noni and she lived with my father and mother from the day they got married. And she uh, was very important to me growing up because my mom my mom did a lot of outside stuff outside the house and a lot of times Nana was was really raising me and uh, I was quite close to her she was a she was a great lady uh, she got senile as she got older and that led to a lot of kind of funny situations in the house um, but she was a great lady and uh, I was very lucky to have the experience of uh, growing up with a uh, with a kind of an extended family. My great grandfather and great grandmother came from Ireland in 19, in 1843, and uh, they knew each other there, and they got married over here, and uh, they had. Uh, two sons and my grandfather was George, one of those two sons and his son was George, my father. So George, my grandfather, was born in Roxbury, Mass at the end of the uh, 19th century and then moved to Hopkinton where the marathon starts. And uh, he was uh, a, uh, an entrepreneur. He began as a young man as a waiter at the Harvard Club, and he started arranging fights, boxing matches, at the Harvard Club. And he met some uh, wealthy guys at the Harvard Club. They asked him if he'd like to be the manager of the Boston Athletic Association and he said yes and then these guys decided to build the Boston Garden and when they built the Boston Garden they asked him if he wanted to run it and he said yes and so that was sometime around 1920 and around 1926 
he bought the Boston Tigers, which was the first professional hockey team in Boston. And he changed the name to the Bruins. He ran the garden until he died, which was in the late 30s. And my uncle Walter took it over, his, his oldest son, Walter Brown. And he found the uh, Celtics. And as a kid, I used to go to all the Bruins games. And I, my uncle let me go into the uh, locker room and pick out a uniform and uh, skates and sticks and gloves. And so I had the, the best of hockey equipment every year uh, from the Bruins, which was really kind of fun. And uh, I went all through uh, high school and then all through uh, art school. I went to a lot of games, but but mostly in high school. That's when I went to every, every game they played. And um, that's about all I did in high school. <laughs> <laughs> and I did get to skate with them, which was uh, Quite an experience. I guess I should tell you what it was rather than just mention it. It was uh, I was a very good skater as a kid. I was very fast and I was big. And I got on the ice with the Bruins and even the goalies were skating by me. They were so much better than I was. It was unbelievable the difference. And then when I was older I got a chance to play with uh, the guys that uh, in the paid, played in the 60 Olympics and went on to beat the, uh, the uh, Russians and then the Czechoslovakians for the gold, gold medal. medal. And uh, I played with a bunch of those guys and uh, I was almost good enough to play with those guys, but not quite, and I didn't make the team. But that was a lot of fun to play with at that level of play. Uncle Walter said he wouldn't let me go to any hockey games unless I went to a brew and the uh, Celtics games. And I didn't give a damn about basketball. I, I, really, uh, I really, at the beginning, really liked the team they had. Guys like Bob Cousy and Tommy Heinsohn and a lot of really great personalities. And we used to go down to the locker room and meet them all and, and all that. I can remember. Bob Cousy was only about 6'1", but he had hands on him. His hands were absolutely giant. <laughs> All those guys were playing for the Celtics, and they won, and they won, and they won. They won everything for like seven or eight years in a row. Uh, and I played hockey until I was 50. I didn't play uh, professionally. Uh, I played football and baseball and ran track and... Uh, not all at the same time. My nickname was Truck, and I was, you know, I was a big stocky kid, but I could run. I played because the football coach was my algebra teacher, and I thought if I played I'd get a better grade in algebra, but it didn't work at all. I ended up taking algebra one three times. Everybody looked at me and said, oh, you must be a football player. And that was really about the reason I played it. <laughs> My father said, oh, geez, you'll be a good football player. Oh, okay. You'll be a good one. I did. Just didn't make any sense to me. I went three years to Brookline High, and then I transferred to a uh, prep school in Maine, Hebrew Academy, which had a great hockey program. I took art in high school, and I, I knew I had a little talent. I hate that word. Tal talent is what people think artists are supposed to have that makes them different from anybody else. And I never felt I was any different from anybody else. I just did it, and I didn't stop doing it. But I did think about being a, an artist. And of course, my family thought I was crazy because I'd never make any money. You know, I didn't pay any attention to that. That was, that was real good advice, too. <laughs> <laughs> Probably in high school, in prep school, I realized that I didn't want to sell insurance or have a desk kind of job. I know that would have been uh, awful for me. Certainly, I certainly had no interest in, in anything else at the age of 17. You know, I, I was, like most kids, just kind of floundering around and didn't know. I didn't have the, the, 
the the brains or the knowledge to make make a really good decision about anything at, at age of 17. The only thing I knew that I liked was art. And because of that, I uh, decided I would try to get to art school, to get into an art school. And I did. I got into uh, Massachusetts College of Art in 1959. I made a decision at the age of 17 or so that um, what I would do with the rest of my life is what I actually did do with the rest of my life. And I really look back on it and, and realize that I had a really wonderful life. Uh, I went on to art school and I, I thought I would learn to paint like uh, the landscape painters of the 19th century, early 19th century painters. Uh, I liked a lot. All through high school I would go to the museum in Boston and I would go through the various departments of the museum and I always seemed to go back to two or three paintings that were by uh, Corot in particular and I would go and I would stare at them and try to understand uh, how he could turn what he was looking at into a beautiful little painting. I went to art school in the early 60s and they were they were teaching abstract expressionist painting and I thought they were crazy. I had no idea, you know, I didn't know anything about, you know, contemporary art. Uh, and I had no, no, my, none of, neither my teacher in uh, high school never mentioned it to me or anything. Or, at the beginning of art school, um, I wasn't sure how, I, how it was going to work out for me. Uh, but then I realized that none of the other guys knew either. And we had teachers that uh, said things like, uh, well, get a canvas. And they'd say, well, what size? Whatever size you'd like would be the answer. And uh, what, do you, what, do you want to use, what do you want me to use for a medium? Well, you can use whatever you want. You want to use oil paint or acrylics. And uh, I, I said oil paint. And then when we got all the stuff together and got into the classroom, and uh, I had, there was no model in the classroom. So I said, well, what are we supposed to paint? And she said, well, you can paint whatever you want. I didn't know what the hell to do. I like the idea of big paintings. I remember that right away. I like big paintings. I didn't know what they were going to be, but they were going to be big anyway. And I did some uh, big kind of landscapey paintings, uh, four by four. And I really sort of really liked the act, the act of putting paint on. I knew that right away. I liked putting the paint on. And so there was, a, there was something that I figured out about myself, that I liked the act of painting. But I still didn't know what to paint and how do you figure out what you want to paint. That was quite a struggle, as it should be, because if you're going to be a, if I was going to be any kind of an artist, I had to have some kind of a, my paintings had to have some meaning to me at any rate. But the lessons I, I probably got in art school that stuck were we, with the conversations I had with other people my own age that were going through the same struggle, which was not so much classroom stuff, but talk in the lunchroom, talk in the bar room, <laughs> mostly talk in the bar room, to tell you the truth. <laughs> but but, I, but I, I kept on at it, and, uh, and I, I, was, I started out doing terrible uh, abstract paintings, absolutely awful abstract paintings. And then I discovered that if I took what I saw as a, you know, a kind of a, a place to begin, I could abstract from what I saw and make, make something that had, a, had some kind of a, a structure to it. So, my paintings from 
probably my sophomore year on, were kind of paintings that were um, were based on landscape, but were were pretty abstract. But they were beginning to get um, satisfying. I had no trouble uh, with dates. I had plenty of dates. Uh, I wouldn't call me a ladies' man, but I, I, you know, I liked women a lot. A friend of mine and myself, and we used to put on parties. We'd rent a hall and buy a keg of beer or two, and then charge a little admission and have big parties for anybody who came in the door. And that was a lot of fun. I should also mention that I'm colorblind. I was colorblind, and I took color courses. I finally came to realize that I wasn't blind to color. I just didn't see color the same way other people did. And that was okay with me, because I didn't do a lot of things a lot of people did. I got through, uh, through my undergraduate courses, and, and, uh, and what I realized was that I had come to the conclusion that you had to have an idea for a painting, and once you finished the painting, then you had to find another idea and do another painting. And it took me years and years to realize that one idea could produce a whole body of work and not just a single painting. I was always trying one thing and then trying another thing, trying another thing. But now as I look back at that work, I can see all the things about them that are the same. And that they already they had an adhesion that I didn't even see, you know, while I was doing them. And uh, that was great to, to see that. Uh, that's something that uh, really meant a lot to me, that I really had, I had, I had big ideas that followed all the way through a lot of my work. I joined the National Guard in uh, 1960, and I served in active duty at Fort Dix in New Jersey. And uh, when I was in the Army down there, I won the All-Army Art Contest. So from that time on, all I did was teach. I never even finished uh, basic training. So the only one that could take these classes and stuff were the, were the wives. And so all my classes were uh, full of uh, officers and enlisted men's wives. <laughs> which was kind of uh, a silly combination of things. But, you know, I, I was really kind of fun. Uh, I enjoyed it, and, and I got a salary above and beyond my military pay, which I think was $80 a month or something. So I was a real, I was not a very good soldier. Uh, I didn't take it seriously. I started to get some real bad back pains. And I went to a doctor, so the doctor said, well, I'll write you a letter. And so he wrote me a letter saying that I was going to have these back problems for the rest of my life, and uh, I would probably end up getting, uh, you know, a medical discharge from the um, Army. My Army career was supposed to be, I think it's eight years or something. And I ended up be, being in for four years, which was perfectly all right with me. After I graduated from art school, I uh, married my childhood sweetheart, and um, and uh, she uh, we had one child, a boy, Dylan, Linda Hardy. She was a beautiful girl. She was in the Miss Massachusetts contest, and she was Miss Quincy. I chased her from my freshman year, and uh, she wouldn't have much to do with me. And then in, uh, by the time we were getting ready to graduate, I guess I was looking better. At any rate, anyway, we got married. I got a teaching job in the town of Hopkinton, Mass, where I taught art and uh, coached football. And uh, it was uh, my first teaching experience. 
And it was, uh, I found out that I definitely didn't like junior high kids. I couldn't stand them. They couldn't stand me. So after one year of that, I got out of that and uh, taught high school kids, which I enjoyed very much. And um, I, uh, I taught there for, uh, caught, taught and coached there for three years. And I had a salary of $3,500 a year, which was a, uh, which was a low average salary for a beginning teacher in 1962. When I was in Hopkinton, I was married to Linda, and we had a, uh, an apartment, well, it was actually a house, and, and I ha was having a good, I, we had a good marriage, Linda and I, and uh, things were going fine. Uh, she was working at the, at the uh, State, State Hospital in Worcester, and she really liked it. And uh, so the, between the two of us, you know, we had our jobs and we, we, uh, we, had, a, we had a pretty good life there. Uh, she was uh, beginning to show signs of uh, some mental problems, but uh, they weren't, they didn't seem to be too, uh, she wasn't very, she was a very happy person, you know. She spent a lot of time worrying, and uh, but we were doing all right, and um, she got she got worse as time went on. But um, I still thought that it was something that we could handle ourselves, and uh, well, it proved that we couldn't handle it ourselves. I was really learning how to teach. And how to, uh, you know, I was only a kid. I was only, what, 22 or three years old. And I wasn't very much older than my seniors, you know. And so I had to learn how to uh, deal with the, uh, de deal with the people that were my own age almost, in terms of uh, uh, being a leader and uh, having them uh, accept me as a, uh, a leader. And, uh, and that was an important part of learning how to, how to teach. They, they, I think teaching, I think coaching the football helped that too, because the boys were more likely to uh, uh, get, get, see me as a leader, uh, you know, uh, if I was telling them how to play football as opposed to telling them how to draw pictures. Although I really didn't know a hell of a lot about football. Really didn't know much about football at all. But I knew more than they did. And I, and I didn't know much about teaching either, so I, I, was, I really had to learn that. And so anyway, I ended up down at Quincy and began my second teaching career at Quincy High School, and I did that for 18 years. I taught drawing and painting, and uh, then I taught some ceramics, which I had a lot of fun with, and, um, and I taught art history and uh, aesthetics. And so I thought the most important thing I taught was uh, the art history and aesthetics. And most kids who take art in high school aren't going to become artists, but they're going to become, they're going to become human beings if they aren't already, and they're going to have to look around the world and see things, and and make just make decisions about whether they like it or whether they don't like it. One course I did, I spent a lot of time developing, was a drawing course, which began by my putting up rectangular pieces of cardboard on a piece of paper. Say it was. A, eight, 16 by 20 piece of paper. And I would put a piece of cardboard up on the, pe on the, on, on the piece of paper that uh, may be a, a rectangular piece of cardboard, and one end of it would touch the very edge of the paper, and then it would go out and, and be there. And I would say, okay, kids, draw that. Just how it, how it was, you know? They had a 16 by 20 piece of paper too. 
and they would draw and try to put that rectangle where it was exactly as it was as they saw it. And then I, you know, I put another little rectangle. And, uh, and so the drawing, the, the designs would become more complicated as, as the days went on. And then I would uh, start making the rectangles into maybe buildings. And they didn't even realize it, but all of a sudden they were doing drawings of landscapes. And, and, and it was pretty successful, you know? Yeah. And that was going right into drawing what they were seeing. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, you get into teaching perspective and all the rest of the tricky things about realistic drawing. And it was a real, it was a real good course, you know? Uh, and, uh, and they were great years. I liked teaching, I liked the high school kids I liked the the guy I taught with. We were two teachers and a two two art teachers in a great big school. I think there was three thousand kids in the school, and we had a big, huge art department and all the f facilities you could ask for. So it was a real great place for me to work, and um, so I stayed there for eighteen years, which was uh, it's quite a career, actually. Um, and I always had a studio, um, so I always was painting as well as uh, teaching, and, uh, and I had shows. And so I was busy, you know, I was a busy guy. And I also coached hockey, which was uh, a lot of fun. I was more involved with sports, than uh, I was in anything else. But I did have a, uh, one, one thing that was my own idea was a, uh, a rock climbing club, because there were lots of places to climb rocks around the old quarries and granite, granite quarries in Quincy and Quincy um, and also in the Blue Hills. And so, uh, Myself and another guy, who was a real outdoorsman type guy, we had this rock climbing club, and uh, and he knew all about ropes and uh, and and how to get kids strapped into things, and so we did it very safely, but they 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 did things, you know that they they you know this was a long time ago before. They were indoor rock, rock climbing walls and all that, but they uh, they learned to trust each other. Get, getting tied in together and climbing up a cliff, where if one fell off, the other one could re really would have the uh, kid's life in their hands, and uh, that was a very uh, ex exciting and uh, I thought very good learning experience for these kids that that wanted to do it. So anyway, uh, my wife Linda was not doing very well as we moved to Quincy, which happened to be her hometown, which we never had discussed what that was like for her to come back to her hometown. Uh, but she was able to connect with some some of the people that she went to high school with. and. So we made some friends, and things were going pretty well, but she was sad. She was sad a lot of the time. And, uh, and after our son was born, Jilla Dillon was born, she, uh, she really was in a, uh, what we thought was a postnatal post depression, where she really, she couldn't even get out of bed. And uh, she was crying all the time, and she had Dylan with her in bed, and it was it was not just not a good a good scene. Although uh, you know, um, we weren't fighting, but there wasn't much to the relationship at that point. And I thought that I could solve all of her problems, 
as only a young man with a good ego thinks. But her problems were far greater than anything I could have handled. Mm -hmm. And so I, so she killed herself and it was a very sad chapter in my life. And I also, I had a daughter that she took with her when she killed herself. So I lost a daughter as well. So uh, that summer, uh, Jill and I took off in a uh, beautiful Volkswagen uh, camper that my younger brother, while he was in in the army in California, he bought and drove back across the country to Massachusetts. We stopped in Detroit and saw my older brother, and that's when I visited Cranbrook and decided that I definitely wanted to go there if I ever had a chance. And then uh, we went from there to um, Montana, where the guy that I went to Cranbrook was now teaching at the uh, University of Montana and living outside of Bozeman, and that was beautiful. We stayed out there for a few days, and um, we went from there down to uh, um, visit another friend who was living down in uh, northern New Mexico, and they rent they were they they had a. Uh, a one-bedroom uh, adobe building out in the middle of the desert. And uh, that was really uh, pretty interesting. Um, I, uh, my memories of that place are of uh, uh, Zillin and their son, I forget his name, they had wicked fights and they fought with sticks. And uh, nobody got hurt or anything, but that was, that was what I remember, which was the first experience I had had with a, you know, like a, he was a, a three-year-old hellion. The two of them were. And uh, so, so I, I, I could begin to see what it was gonna be like raising this wild little guy. And, uh, and it was just like I thought it was going to be. I, you know, I wanted to go to Cranbrook. I never thought I'd get in there. And then I didn't realize, you know, well, what am I going to do with Dylan when I'm going to Cranbrook? I got the letter saying that I had been excused or I had been accepted into Cranbrook, which was great because they only take like six, six painters in their graduate program every year. And then, it, you know, it dawned on me that George was uh, living right down the street, practically, from Cranbrook. And uh, so Dylan could stay there, and so it all kind of fell together. And it made it so that I could go to graduate school and uh, Dylan would have a really nice place to live with, uh, you know, his uncle and, uh, and his cousins. Uh, he had, they, were, they had a kid the same age as him. Graduate school was a couple of towns over, so I could, you know, put Dylan to bed every night. And then there was actually only one, one professor and, uh, that taught painting. I looked at this George Ortman, uh, as a, a very wise man who, uh, who was very comfortable in his, his own skin and uh, very comfortable in his own paintings, which I liked too. They were nothing like anything I ever, I ever saw before. They were, they were kind of interesting, but it was more he was an interesting guy than, uh, than anything else. The way I met him was, uh, I don't know, the first night I was at Cranbrook, I bought myself a bottle of Irish whiskey, and I went down to the, uh, the, the, the they have a, like a recreation room 
that you know there was a band there and you could buy buy beers and everything. And so I I was sitting down there with my bottle of John Jameson and uh, in walks the, this guy who I didn't know and he turned out to be uh, my instructor. Most of the teaching was done through, um, you would show your work to your peers and your peers would talk to you about what you were doing. And that was, that was very, very interesting for me. Of course, at that point, you know, I'd been teaching for 10 years and I'd been painting for 10 years. So I had a, a pretty good idea about how to paint, but I still had no idea about what to paint. And so I, I, I jumped around a lot uh, from one kind of a painting to another kind of a painting. Um, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about, about painting, about why you paint. Not so much about what you paint, because that was pretty much up to me, whatever I wanted to paint. But why did I have this, why was I getting this need to paint? And, and I kept that need right along. I, I went through a, different, a lot of different ways of working, and it was, it was great. It was, it was all I could have asked for in graduate school. And while I was out there, I met a young lady who uh, we liked each other, and so uh, we started to go together. And, uh, you know, it was the first woman that I had anything to do with uh, since, uh, since I knew uh, Linda. And, um, and, and then that grew into a pretty steady relationship. And we were getting along real good, and so uh, it was time for me to go back to uh, Massachusetts. And I asked her if she wanted to come with me. And she said, sure. And so I thought, well, that would be good, because then I'd have somebody with me who could help me with Dylan and, uh, and uh, until, she, until he got a little bit older. Uh, but she said, oh, well, I, I want to go back to Boston. Boston with you, but I want to marry you. And I wasn't really excited, too much excited about that. I thought of it more like a, a temporary kind of a thing. But we did get married, and uh, it went pretty well. Dylan, and she got along really well. She's a fine woman, and uh, I don't regret our marriage. I'm sorry it didn't work out, but it didn't. And. Uh, so we lived in Brookline, and, and as our relationship started to go downhill, uh, and she decided she was going to leave me, and uh, ended up going to uh, California, and she met a guy out there, and they've been together ever since, and she's happy, and uh, she and Dylan are still in touch. And that's really nice. And um, and then I I uh, I had this house, this three-story duplex with just Dylan and I in it. And so I rented out some uh, rooms. And one of the people I uh, rented a room to was uh, Jody Wilson. There were two things that I think of particularly that attracted me to Ray besides the fact that we were both interested in art and architecture, we had common interests. One is... My body. Oh, of course. <laughs> that goes... That, Three I, things. Don't even have to mention that part. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. But before I found out about that part... <laughs> um, he had a really, really nice way about him when we would have parties, have people over. When he came in the room, it seemed to me people became at ease and the tenor changed. Maybe it was just me. And the other thing was he had a lot of stress. He had had a lot of tragedy in his life. <coughs> and I remember just loving him and thinking that, you know, this tragedy isn't fair and he deserves to be happy. That, I really think that's one of the things that uh, 
I felt really strongly. Um, so move forward quickly. We um, became an item, had a really good time. I was uh, sure I want to get married again. Um, and so Jody left and went to California and took a job in an architectural firm and uh, lived in uh, Northern California and was having a good time and having a good life. I decided I wanted to go to graduate school at University of California, Berkeley. There was a um, designer there that I was totally infatuated with and I wanted to study landscape architecture with him. And, um, and I missed her a lot much more than I thought I was going to. Mm. And so um, there I got on a plane and flew out there and uh, found her and uh, convinced her to come back. So we got together again and uh, more seriously this time and I was ready to make any kind of commitment. We ended up in Vermont and, uh, and uh, rented a quite a strange little house on a, on a mill pond that had a stream that ran under it in uh, Woodbury, or South Woodbury. And uh, so you could hear the water running all the time through the stream. And then sometime around the end of January, the stream would, would freeze up. And the whole, and the quiet was, it was so quiet, it would take us, a month before we could get to sleep. It was so quiet after having the stream all the time. We guess we, we'd made the commitment to a Vermont and we had to figure out a way to make our living. I was doing freelance work. I wasn't hired by the architects that I did work for. Um, they, I was going around trying to talk everybody into hiring me and they gave me jobs, uh, contract jobs. Um, and I was making, we didn't have really any money, so I was making money at night um, bartending so that I could do that. And she was bartending at uh, Charlie's in Montpelier. We were pretty poor and uh, that was nothing new. Um, so uh, I got a job with uh, community action, screening people that were looking for um, help uh, weatherizing their their houses in Vermont, and that was it was a great job because I go around to all these rundown old houses and trailers and meeting all these people that were real Vermonters who needed help with their housing, and it was really quite a nice job. Uh, I liked it a lot. It was kind of ironic that here's a kid coming up from Brookline, Mass to tell people from Vermont how to winterize their houses. <laughs> but that's like anything else, you know. It's like the Army. You end up in the Army and you end up teaching art. Well, <laughs> I ended up weatherizing houses in Vermont. Dylan, by this time, was, uh, I guess he was 15. And, uh, and he got involved with some kids who lived in South Woodbury and went to um, high school in Hardwick. And uh, I thought, you know, moving to Vermont would be a better place for him because he, he liked to be, uh, being outdoors and everything. And, uh, and there was, you know, less chance of drugs and alcohol and everything. Well, that was certainly not true. The kids in Vermont were just as, just as wild as the kids in Brookline were. And, uh, and he was just as wild there, too. But he, he met some good kids, too, you know. But they did. They did a lot of smoking dope and, and drinking and raising hell. Dylan was really uh, not happy at uh, at high school in Hardwick. So we decided we'd move into the the best ta best educated place we knew of, which was U32 in East Montpelier. 
Dylan was a handful growing up. Uh, um, he was a handful from day one. Uh, you know, he would, like, when he was three years old, he found a loose picket on the fence in the backyard, and he kicked it out and took off. <laughs> <laughs> that sort of set the set the stage. <laughs> I don't even think he was three. And then uh, he uh, he lost his mother when he was three, and it was just the two of us. And that was uh, that was pretty tough. But he did, while he was in um, in Vermont, develop a real strong work ethic. He worked with a uh, builder who was a state representative, and uh, he taught Dylan uh, what it was to work. And he uh, he worked in, in his, his carpenter's helper, and uh, while he was still going to school, and then we we moved again and from Woodbury, and so he went to another new school, and uh, and he made some good friends there. He didn't get in a lot of trouble there, but he just had no interest in academics at all. And so, uh, he wasn't a happy guy, I don't think. He wasn't a very happy guy, right? He went through a lot, and he, he has a very intense personality anyway. He's very smart, he's very, very funny, he likes people, but he has an anger that he has a really hard time control, controlling, um, and a lot of stress that he has a hard time controlling. Um, so he's a mixed bag, but I guess the worst thing was when we were living in East Montpelier, he didn't finish school and he had a girlfriend. They went to Boston together. Um, oh no, we had to tell him to leave home. That was awful. Yeah, we went to a, the, the minister who married us, and we were explaining our... He was stealing from us. Yeah, and he said, uh, you know, you don't, you, you, don't de you don't deserve to live like that. Uh, you gotta get him out of there, and so uh, we did. We, we threw him out. We had a little bit of trouble with the law, and he needed $50 bail, is my recollection, and he said, we weren't going to bail him out, but we would pay for him to get help and go to Spofford Hall in New Hampshire, I think it was. And he did do that. It wasn't his idea. It didn't work. He and his girlfriend took off for Florida, and he sent us a letter from, had a friend mail it from Massachusetts saying that not to worry about him, he was fine, but we lost track of him for a couple of years. And that was really awful. That was scary, just scary. We didn't know where he was, and he didn't get in touch with us. And that's when, when Ryan was born. He got in touch with us when Susan became pregnant, yeah. And the relationship didn't work out, and they came back to Brookline and uh, broke up. And it was, they had a very difficult time then. You know, he, he grew up and finally started to get his own shit together without bothering us anymore. And uh, he became a, a roofer and he joined the union and he really liked his work and he did it for uh, 20, 25 years. And um, then he got cancer and, and couldn't do it anymore, but he, he got his uh, license as a contractor and so he has, uh, now he gets guys to work for him and they do uh, private houses. And so he has a little business. And he's, he's met a real nice woman and uh, they live together down on Cape Cod. And, and so, you know, it took a long time, but he's really a nice guy and, uh, and I'm very proud of him and I'm glad he's my son. So those kinds of things, they finally work themselves out. And Ryan is very much his father's son. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, everybody has problems in their lives, and uh, they come in different shapes and colors, but they're, they're all their own problems. You know, and I try to take care of as much as I can to uh, take care of myself and take care of Jody and do what I can for Dylan and, and Ryan, and uh, 
as long as I live, I'll continue to do that, I hope. I genuinely love Dylan, and I think he genuinely loves me now. And I think probably it was very difficult for him to accept me at first. We decided after we had purchased land together, lived together, lived apart, lived together again in Vermont. At some point, we couldn't imagine, we'd figure out how to support ourselves. We were comfortable together. We couldn't imagine not being together ever. So we decided to celebrate with a wedding. And we had a wonderful wedding on our land in Woodbury with a tent and New England Culinary Institute and Joe Burrell and the Moon Band and lots of friends. And it was really, that was a great way to do it because by the time we got married, we had, we didn't have our doubts about each other. When I made up my mind that uh, I was going to enter into a serious relationship, it would be Jody. And I wasn't really sure that it was a good idea because of the age difference. Um, and uh, my, my concern was, uh, what's going to happen when I get old? I mean, uh, she's going to be stuck with a, a, a guy that's uh, you know, very late in his life, and uh, she's going to be right at the high point of, you know, her years. And uh, I was, I worried about that not being particularly fair to her. It's been a great, great long relationship, and I have no qualms or, uh, you know, I don't feel bad about any of it. So we picked up and moved to a, a house in East Montpelier, and so Dylan could go to U32. And uh, we liked East Montpelier a lot. And uh, we rented this sort of modern, hippie built house. And uh, we stayed there for a few years. And at the same time, we were looking for a place to buy. And we found this schoolhouse. It was a nice looking building, but it was a, it was a schoolhouse. It wasn't a house at all. It wasn't set up to be lived in. And uh, But we found out we could buy it and we could afford it. And so we uh, we did. And we got a builder and he made it into a hall for us. I designed the space. I got to use all the ideas I was excited about. And then it became real. You know, it was a big design project that got built. And, and ended up being a wonderful environment. That project and also the renovation of the home that we live in now, very close to that kind of a feeling and engagement. The drawing board, which is the art supply business in Montpelier, didn't even have leads when I was doing drafting, and that's a real basic art supply. The inventory was pretty low, and we discovered that John Winston was trying to sell it. Jody was a picture framer. He'd been framing pictures for two or three years while we lived in Brookline. And I knew a lot about our materials, as did she. And I was a pretty good people person. So uh, we thought that it was uh, going to be a, a good fit for us. So we ended up doing that for 33 years. So it was a good fit. I have to say it was Jody's uh, business acrum that really made it possible, though. She was the one that really uh, took the bull by the horns and learned all about what it meant to run a business. I was the guy out front who dealt with the customers on a daily basis. Like Ray said, we grew from very little equipment um, and no employees. We grew up to... Uh, when I sold the business to Liz, it was five full-time, two part-time. The longest employee had been there since 1990. The people people come into Montpelier and they say, oh, how come that place isn't open anymore? Well, it isn't open anymore because the person or persons that were providing the, the, the basic for why it was there 
have retired or died or, <laughs> or gone on to something else, and nobody wanted to do it again. So small businesses do turn over and close, you know, and they do. They can close for a lot of the reasons that aren't necessarily because they, they failed. People think, oh, that's too bad that business failed. No, it didn't fail. It just ran its course, you know. I don't think for me it ever got, it got to the point where it wasn't scary. <laughs> because, it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that I just had to put your energy into or it wasn't going to work. You know, it just, it simply wasn't going to work. It was, you know, these little businesses are very much personality driven. And if you don't have the, uh, that, that ability to connect with people, it isn't going to work, no matter what it is you're selling. It becomes your life, basically. It did for me become my life. Ray could always keep his artwork and painting going. There were many, many uh, local artists uh, who became our friends uh, as we ran the drawing board. And what I remember most about it was how similar it was for me to teaching was running uh, running that store because most of our customers came in with visual problems to solve. Either they were going to make something that was a real object or a painting, or uh, and they they wanted to know what materials to use, how to begin, and all of those kind of questions, which were pretty uh, pretty much the same kinds of things that people that are taking a class ask, and those are the kinds of things that. I felt very comfortable about answering. It was unbelievable that we found this way to make a living. Only in retrospect do I look, look back at my evolution uh, in terms of the store, and I think that mine was, was slower than Jody's. I think I was more set in my ways and less open to uh, new things than Jody was. We had already had uh, one burst of, we borrowed some money and um, done a good rehab with uh, equipment, updated to newer, new equipment that had come out, got the state-of-the-art equipment. Our next phase was going to be a renovation. And then the flood of 92 hit. It was, well, we're either going to just go all in and do the renovation or we're not going to reopen. It took a while to get all cleaned out and operational again, but then we did close for a month. And we emptied the store out and just redid it top to bottom. And after that, it was a much more sophisticated and nicer architecturally. We lost uh, like $75,000 worth of inventory which is a lot in a really small business in 92. But we qualified for a um, FEMA loan, so we went pretty far into debt. So it was a tough time, but Montpelier really bounced back. The new store was great, and eventually um, we paid off our loans, except for I think we always operated with a line of credit for a slow month or two. Um, but we did, you know, we did well. It was a great, um, it was a learning experience for sure. But I, I think we were able to grow the business every year, every year until the big drop in 2007, seven, eight, um, our recession <laughs> when the, everything kind of everything hit. We'd have a little profit or a little loss at the end of every year, but but we grew the business and, and we went from taking hardly any money out at all to a livable wage, you know, not a lot, but a livable wage. And towards the end, a quite good, I got a quite good wage. Um, and now I'm financing the business. I'm trying to think, maybe Five years into it, we really decided that Liz was going to be the next owner. And we had a six-year transition of um, passing on my knowledge, me taking less and less of a role um, in the day-to-day -day and more special projects until they didn't need me anymore and, and they needed my salary to 
to uh, Liz needed my salary to purchase the business. So we had a great seamless transition, and I think it's the same employees are still there, and I expect it to be very successful. And like Ray said, we, it needed young, fresh energy and a different viewpoint. And now I go into the store as a customer, and uh, I see this, this stuff that the new owner has brought in and how she's changing it gradually in a different direction than I would have. And I see it as a very positive sign. And it's really, uh, really great. I think she's doing a terrific job. No, I never made enough money on my, selling my paintings to really uh, be able to uh, feel it in terms of uh, our monthly income or anything like that. Sometimes it, I made enough money so we could go on a vacation, you know, uh, and that w without, you know, thinking, oh, we're going to be uh, really destitute for the next six months because of this vacation. There was, there was, you know, there was that kind of money. But I've always felt that uh, success in painting is uh, painting such a way that people liked what I painted. But I mean, they could like it without wanting to spend five thousand dollars on a painting, you know. Or five hundred. <laughs> or two hundred. <laughs> well, I was going to say that I tried to try to keep my prices down so that people who do enjoy them can afford can afford to buy them. I don't give them away. Uh, but I don't, you know, I don't go along with uh, charging uh, excessively for painting. You've never been interested in marketing. You've been interested in the process. Right. Um, you don't, he hasn't had to have a lot of sales or big uh, recognition for his ego. What he likes to do is paint. You like showing a lot, and you like other people to have your paintings and enjoy them. Right. He calls himself an obscure regionalist. <laughs> but there are a lot of paintings in, in a lot of homes in central Vermont. It's unbelievable. I was going through those slides of how many paintings. It's probably a thousand other paintings that I didn't think were worth even taking the slide off. But the, the paintings in there, Jesus, they're really good. <laughs> it was really fun to look, look through them all and, uh, and feel good about it. When I was in my mid-50s, I decided that I was drinking too much and uh, I was going to lose everything unless I stopped drinking, and so I did. And Jody did too, although she probably didn't have to as much as I had to. It wasn't uh, consuming her life like it was with me. I realized I was spending all of my spare time uh, drunk or drinking. And my idea of having a good time was to get together with a bunch of people and drink. And so uh, it became clear to me that if I was going to really get anything going, I was going to have to quit drinking. And, uh, and that was the best thing I ever did. Uh, uh, I remember Ray being hospitalized and being on oxygen and not being able to breathe. And uh, it was pretty clear he couldn't smoke anymore. Was that after you quit drinking or before? Right about at the same time. You were really sick. Yeah, I, yeah, I quit drinking and smoking and within a month of each other. Ray was also, besides being physically ill, he had become unhappy. He was all, always a really happy, fun drinker and person. And I didn't attribute it to alcohol, but things, our home became um, not violent or anything, but just not happy. And I, so I thought, I thought our marriage was not good anymore. Um, so I made an appointment to see a psychiatrist to talk about it at Ray's brother Walter's urging. Um, and I was so frustrated that I dragged Ray with me. <laughs> So we both saw this doctor and he said, it may not be the only problem or your biggest problem, but I don't think you guys are going to be able to sort, I think you love each other and you're not going to be able to sort things out unless you get rid of the alcohol.
And Ray says he walked out and just knew that, that he had had his last drink. I was kind of like, well, let's go home and have a drink and think about it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, because it was yeah. going to be a big life change. <laughs> <laughs> right, our social life certainly evolved was around. all totally evolved around drinking. And so did our quiet times. Yeah. We'd sit down at night and I'd have a, a couple of glasses of scotch and you'd have a, a half to a quart of, or a whole bottle of wine. And, uh, and we, didn't, we didn't see that as being anything wrong. My folks drank every night and... Uh, so did mine. I mean, it was just what people did. I didn't know anybody who didn't drink daily. <laughs> I got some help, you know. I uh, went to a psychiatrist and had a lot of friends, including my younger brother, Walter, who had already gotten sober before he moved to Vermont. And he was a great help. Like he told me about, I always had a list of things that, that were wrong in my life. And he said, well, why don't you get sober and you'll watch that list will just disappear. And that's exactly what happened. Mm -hmm. All the problems in my life just were all in my head and they just plain disappeared. And so I, uh, so I started to feel a lot better. I had a lot more energy and a lot more time. You know, taking, drinking takes a lot of time. And uh, I spent a lot of time in the bottle. And so uh, it really, my, my painting started to really uh, take off at that time. So Ray knew he was done, and at least this is the way I perceive it, or the way he told it to me. Um, and he went to Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, I did too. It took me, I think it was, I was about three years after Ray in, in uh, finally getting sober and, and uh, staying that way, have, having had my last drink. But I did do it through AA, and I don't think I could have done it another way. I got a lot of help. And come to find out, when we stopped drinking, all that unhappiness just went right away. <laughs> and I, around 1996 is when I, I quit drinking. And at the same time, we started to travel. I think we took our first trip to Europe in 2000. And then about every two years we went over. The second trip I planned, and that was Paris through southern France, um, and then over to Barcelona and home from Barcelona. That was our second trip. And our third trip was to Italy. And then our fourth, fifth, sixth trips were all to Italy. <laughs> we just love Italy, so. Yeah, and I hope we can go back. I'd like to go back one more time. This Ray has a group of friends that he's known since they were kids. He calls the Chestnut Hill Gang, and all of us get together. It was every 10 years, then it's five years, and I think we've got to speed it up now. <laughs> <laughs> we're starting to die off. <laughs> We've lost uh, two members. Yeah. The stroke came out of the blue. We were both felt young and just doing our thing. It was in the morning and he was like kind of gurgling and I asked him if he had a cold and he, when he turned to me and went to talk, his face was all lopsided and he couldn't talk correctly, and I didn't know what stroke was. I just knew there was something really wrong. Of course, I called emergency right away, and it started the whole ball rolling. Uh, I called work. I said, you guys are on your own. I don't know for how long, and I focused on Ray's rehab. I learned everything I could about stroke. I didn't leave his side. Um, except to come home every few days. I learned everything about the brain, about neuroplasticity that I could, about why he didn't recognize the right side, why he was paralyzed. I would sit in a certain place to get him to work that, uh, that part of his brain to get it going again. Um, 
my job was to empathize and um, just figure out how we could deal with it the best way we could possibly deal with it. Uh, and I took that on as a full-time job for about six months until, um, until I went back to work. And then it still has been a journey since then. Maybe it might have occurred to me I couldn't do a good job, but it never occurred to me it was something I should question whether I should be doing or not, or whether we should be doing or not, or um, never question our love for each other, or commitment to each other. And uh, I had to learn how to uh, accept my my physical disabilities and uh, and do the best I could with it. Uh, and, uh, and that's what I did. Uh, so I, I, I couldn't do what, what my job was. So I, I, really, uh, I really couldn't go back uh, to the store. I think I wanted to go back, at least on a part time. I wasn't ready not to work when I had the stroke. I was 66. So, you know, I mean, I could have retired. I, you know, I don't, with, with no, no feeling as though I wasn't pulling my own weight or anything. It wasn't that. It was just that I liked the job and I missed the people. And all of a sudden, not to have a job and not to get up and go someplace in the morning was a real, uh, was a real downer. Um, my going back was really hard. It just felt surreal. <laughs> because everything changed when he had the stroke, and it was just odd. <laughs> but we had a, like I say, we had great employees, and um, and it changed into my store instead of our store. For the first year I was home from uh, the rehab place, I was in a wheelchair, and so I couldn't have even gone out to my studio, let alone uh, thinking I could do anything out there. And I had people always tell me, you know, Ray, you're never going to get out of this wheelchair and you're never going to work again, so you might as well get used to it. And I said, no, that's not true. I'm going to get out of this wheelchair and I am going to paint again. And I, and I did. You'll have to excuse me if I can't be very specific about that. And it's, it's because I simply don't remember a lot of it. You know, I was I, my, my brain wasn't really working very well. It still isn't, but maybe you can tell that anyway. <laughs> we did take him to Florida in a wheelchair um, and practice with gait belt and braces, walking, and then he got a lot more help after we got back with home health. He still didn't have use of the left hand and arm. So he was very clever about rigging up uh, ways to fasten down um, his medium and his uh, brushes and paint so that he could work single-handed. And then we worked on that arm and you finally got use of your left hand, which helped a lot. <laughs> that was a huge change. He's got such acceptance which I'm not a patient accepting person, although I've learned to be much more so. But as a mentor in terms of dealing with physical limitations and not being frustrated about what you can't do, but just accepting where you're at and moving forward, it's just a, just a treat to watch that. Um, very inspirational. Um, well, thank you. The work started out with buildings, simple buildings and a Vermont landscape. And then, as I recall, you found um, your voice when we went to Italy. The Italian landscape really uh, affected me and, uh, and the colors and the forms and stuff really, uh, really, uh, really worked on me a lot. And, uh, bunches of buildings. And that's where the abstraction started to come from, was these bunches of buildings. This is a painting 
with, with sort of about Siena. Uh, I associate red with the, the city of Siena. And as you walk into the uh, main square in uh, Siena, it's, it's a long, dark walk into it. And then you come in and there's this beautiful Gothic cathedral. It's white with colors on it. And the, and the light just really banks off of it. It's really very, very extraordinary. And uh, then you kind of walk around that, go down a hill through all these beautiful old brick and stone buildings. Then you could say this painting here was a high point in that group of paintings. And then one painting led to another, led each painting, rather than painting outside looking at something, he was painting in the studio and each painting suggested the next painting and it was a process that you were really excited about, still are. Yes, um, I am. And yeah. you would say to me, I don't know where they're coming from, but they're just, they're just coming. They're coming. The paintings were sort of coming through him, the ideas. And it was very exciting. I think his work is, is uh, as good or better than it's ever been, just different. Yeah. And that's kept going for 11 years now. And I went back to, to my abstract expressionist roots, where I was, where I, that's what I was learning in art school, although I didn't know it at the time. Um, because those are the guys that were the, uh, the, the big honchos in painting at the time. People like uh, Robert Wood Motherwell and uh, de Kooning. I decided that I was going to kind of uh, somehow within my own structure uh, loosen up the way I painted. And that's what I, I did. And I tried to apply that to uh, the idea of landscape that I got from Italy and approached it soberly. I get such a pleasure out of my painting and uh, just keeps right on going. And I have to find my, my satisfaction and joys within the range that I have left for me. And, uh, and I seem to be able to do that, so. Where's the complaint? What's the sense of complaining? There's no sense in it at all. The last thing that happened was and I found out I could with my left hand. And so I painted uh, four pretty good little paintings and, uh, and that's, that's, been, that's been very rewarding. But the big abstract ones have uh, just started to come back to be rewarding and, uh, and as important as the little ones are. And that's what I, I, I don't want to stop you doing either kind of painting. So I, I can no longer stretch my own canvases. That's definitely a two-hand job, and I can't do it. But I still have, you know, physical problems about walking and like getting up and down out of a chair and, and that kind of stuff. I can't do as much around the house as I'd like to. But I'm trying, and um, and you know I'm trying, and. Um, you seem to be all right with uh, the way it is right now, and so um, I'm all right with it too. So we go on every day from there. Um, but it is our, uh, my, it's my love for Jody that is the primary thing that keeps me in, uh, you know, keeps me alive. And uh, I thought it was your love for pain. Well, that's, that's, I wouldn't have that if I didn't have you. <laughs> Lady in the back. 
Um, hi, Ray. It's Emma. Hi, Emma. Um, <laughs> yeah. So we have stroke in common, and I wanted to know when was what was the experience of first? Like, do you remember? You said your brain wasn't functioning 100%, but do you remember the time when you kind of first, like, the frustration of first trying to paint? or what that experience was like for you when you first picked up a brush again? Well, it was terrible because I was trying to do it with my right hand. Mm -hmm. The hand I had always painted with. Mm -hmm. and, it, and I couldn't do it at all. Couldn't, you know, couldn't control it at all. And so that was really awful. And then I, then it occurred to me that I, I wanted to do it, I was going to have to do it with my left hand. Mm -hmm. And that became that seemed such a natural thing for me to do that I had no trouble with it. I really liked it. Mm -hmm. Pretty much after I, I realized I could no longer do it with my right hand at all. Uh, that was kind of a, that was good in a lot of ways because it, it gave me a new way to see things and express myself. And uh, so it wasn't really, uh, I didn't look at it as a, uh, a real, like a handicap. I the, the handicap part of it for me is uh, I can't, you know, I have a hard time shaving <laughs> or uh, or doing the dishes, or any things like that that I can't do anymore. That really bothers me a lot. But I don't dwell on it. You know, you, I can't dwell on what I can't do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've got much better more of, out of figuring out what I can do and getting better at it that way than sitting around trying to, you know, thinking of all the things I can't do anymore. Right. You know, I love to skate. Skated all my life. Mm -hmm. I played hockey till I was 50. And I'd love to get on the ice again, but I know I'm not going to. Mm -hmm. I'll go down, I'll fall down. You know, I'll end up in the hospital again. I have to let go of things. And I think that's what the secret to uh, surviving a, a stroke or anything else like that is, is. You have to go with what you got. And you can't dwell on what you used to have. It's not going to do you any good anymore. And the other thing is... Uh, well, I can't imagine what it would be like to have a small child and get a stroke. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, God Almighty, I can't, I can't imagine what that would be like to lose half the side of my body and still have to deal with a, a three-year-old or something. God. Three-day-old. Three-day-old. Yeah. But I didn't have any of that. I, was, I waited until I was older. <laughs> I waited until I was on Social Security. <laughs> God Almighty, what would have happened if I had had it younger? Good Lord! The money! The pills I have to take! Oh, I think I take 25 pills a day. And you know, none of them are cheap. Right. <laughs> Right. It's unbelievable. Costs more than drinking. <laughs> <laughs> Bill? Hi, uh, Bill Pelton. I just wanted to say, even though we've lived uh, in the same area for many, many decades, and we certainly know each other by name, um, I, I never had the opportunity to get to know you well. Thank you for taking the leap, for being so incredibly open yeah. And thank you, Nat, for having the idea or, or you know, making the film. Um, and, and I want to say, I'm, I'm a bit interested in film and video myself, and I won't say that uh, the differences in, you know, shot quality and so forth went completely unnoticed, but when it comes down to it, what matters is the storytelling. And I thought right. you did, you both. You all did a wonderful job with the storytelling, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you, you know, both in having the idea, the way you chose to shoot it, and I'm sure a lot of it happened in the editing room. So I just wanted to say thank you very much for um, a wonderful, warm human project. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Gary? Uh, I just. Uh, 
overall notice that uh, in, in this view, uh, you've had a lot of uh, troubles through your life, but there always seems to be silver lining in, in all of these things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, that, that's the thing that comes out to me in this film, is that, is that uh, no matter hard it is, how, well, it almost tempers you. These troubled times tempers you for, for uh, other parts of your life. And the silver lining is, uh, I think, quite amazing. That a lot I feel of that way too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think it's the only way to do it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. Not, it is. Much, uh, not much choice, I guess. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah, what's the other choice? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You sit around and feel sorry for yourself? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm around and blame other people. Mm -hmm. Say, I could have got better doctors. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'd probably never think of using your left hand unless you had the stroke. Oh, no, I would. No, no. And no, I would not. And yet it's opened up a whole new... Absolutely. ...new part of you. Yeah, that was really uh, quite amazing to me. There's a guy over there in the back. Yes. Hi, Mark. Um, I uh, I just wonder about, um, I'd love to hear you comment, Ray, about how you see the things that you're painting now compared to the way that you saw them before, because I, I having seen a lot of your work over the years and knowing your skills and, and seeing some of the examples of your uh, born-again landscapes, um, you know, post-stroke, you, you can paint that way still if you chose to, and you choose to. But the abstraction is something that you didn't seem to really gravitate towards before, but now you're, you're actually in, you know, intrigued by it and you're thrilled with it and you're motivated. I'm wondering if somehow it isn't just the physical act of painting, but just you're seeing things in a different way, and I wonder if you have some comments about that. I don't, uh, I don't, I don't know. Uh, I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't say if I'm seeing things uh, differently because uh, uh, I don't remember how I used to see them. <laughs> you know, I can only see them the way I see them. Mm. I'm going to jump in here for a second because I remember a lot more of the post-stroke, the initial post-stroke. You stand up, Jody, so um, people can hear you. Better. Sorry, I have a low voice anyway. I remember more of the initial stroke raise memory about that is not that great. But one thing that really hit me was it never occurred to him that he wouldn't paint. Mm -hmm. Ever. Mm -hmm. No matter it, it was just mm -hmm. a, it just was a non issue. Um, and in terms of the work, he was quite once he got a routine of painting, he was very liberated to be able to um, get away from small, fussy landscapes that he did on site, he did outdoors. That wasn't impossible for him anymore, but he really loved the, he was kind of astonished at the way the abstract compositions were coming, um, and you were really happy with it. Mm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, like I mean, I think we said that a little bit, uh, that it was very exciting. Um, yeah, still is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it, originally, he painted, well, he told you that a uh, little bit. He started out abstract in school. Mm -hmm. But this was a whole different thing. It was like mm -hmm. the paintings were sort of painting themselves one after the other. And mm -hmm. it's like, wow. Where's this coming from? <laughs> yeah, it was really nice. I like those in the back wall. Mm -hmm. And prior to that, you were painting for an audience. So you also uh, felt free. You just were painting uh, only what you wanted to paint when you went abstract. You're not painting paintings that you thought people would like or buy. Yeah, oh yeah, I, I suppose. Uh, That's the other thing I remember. I, I still paint because I like to paint. So I don't mind if I sell it. <laughs> <laughs> One thing that uh, some of you may not know is how prolific Ray is. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, Very. He, 
How, how many paintings would you say for the last 20 years you paint in oh my God. a week or a month? Well, it, it, I didn't paint that many before I had the stroke. Uh, because I was doing other things like drinking. <laughs> I was going to say, since you got sober, <laughs> you've been quite prolific. Yeah, well, I can say right right now I got, uh, oh, I got, I think about 10 paintings from uh, uh, last, from, from 2019, or 2018. Mm -hmm. uh, I got probably, uh, We looked today, Ray, and you had done 10 paintings in the last two weeks. I've done yeah, two that paintings. sounds more like it. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> That's what we were talking about. Like a little, like, small like landscapes yeah. like these. Mm -hmm. We had 10 new ones since uh, well, January. Yeah. Okay. Wow. Thank you. For oh, I'm sure. Yes. Um, I was intrigued by the, the paintings of Sienna, the abstracted one mm -hmm. of Sienna. And, but it seemed like the trips to Italy, were they all before the stroke? And no, 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 they were all after the stroke. Well, no, there were a couple before. I no? Mean, oh, they were all after yeah. the stroke. Oh. They were all after the stroke. Yeah. yeah. Wow. But they, they were very interesting. The France and um, Ireland and England, our first two trips to Europe were before. And mm -hmm. most of that could be in a while. Um, right. Okay. But Italy, I mean, I rented a car and a place to stay and thought, well, we'll do what we can. We'll find out. Mm -hmm. okay. And then we went back and left. Over there, Heidi. Hi. Um, this is where we talk a lot about your experience teaching. myself all over again. Mm -hmm. um, I still have trouble like taking the tops off a tube of paint <laughs> with one hand, you know? Yeah. That's pretty yeah. tricky. Yeah. So I have teeth. I don't have teeth anymore. <laughs> Hi, I'm Mary Rain and Hi. I've always admired your work. Uh, Thank you. And uh, I really enjoy the way you talk about your creative process and how that works through you. And it just comes. Cause I feel that for myself. We're, we're, when I'm really on top of my game, that's how it is. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, it, there's no thinking. That's right. The minute I think, it gets in the way. It's <laughs> like, I always say, I go into the studio and I check out. Mm -hmm. yeah, right. And my creative process takes over. Yeah. But the one thing I found was when I was drinking, I couldn't, re I was limited to the conscious world as far as mm. making my work, you know. But when I'm not drinking, I have access to the universe, you know, yeah, and right. yeah. which gives me far more reach. And I think that this is well expressed mm. in, in this movie, in this, you know, documentary. Right, yeah, right. Yeah, it's the idea that. Uh, the last paintings I painted before I stopped drinking were were little paintings like this, but there was every every pane of glass right. was painted with great detail, and they they lost any spontaneity. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, they would they were very they were too too realistic to be. Uh, they weren't even they were more like photographs. You know? Right. Why didn't I just take a picture of it? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Is that Dr. Butch? Yes. 
How did Dick uh, remember me, Ray? Dick Butch? Hi, how are you? I've an known old you. Hockey player. I've known you in many ways over the years. First on the ice, <laughs> then in the hospital, then in the store. Yeah. One time in your home studio. Yeah. I think this evening you paid things to such a higher level. So inspiring, reaching across so many different people this evening in the community. And we're so fortunate to have you and Jody and Matt. Mm -hmm. None of us could ever do what you've done. You were once a teacher. I wondered if you ever thought about teaching art. And I also wonder if you have any old Boston stories for us tonight. <laughs> <laughs> You taught art for 35 years. I don't know if you missed that part. Yet. More than 35 years. Uh, no, let's see. Uh, no, I only taught art. Oh, no, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm wrong. 21 years. 21 years. <laughs> Over 35 years of the drawing board. Right. Wow. going to see the Corot paintings in the Boston Museum. I'm wondering uh, what painters are you looking at now? Um, and maybe to Nat, uh, are, are there filmmakers that, that you're uh, inspired by these days? I don't know if I can think of their names. <laughs> my you know, my short-term memory is about yeah. gone. Uh, who's the guy who painted the, the squares? Laundry 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 Laundry. John Scully? Yeah. John Scully? Yeah. Uh, Scully is one of the painters that I like. Uh, and that, that Italian guy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, you still have my book on him. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just answer part two of that question real quick. I, when I was a film student, I studied with, um, uh, I'm getting older too, I can't remember his name, oh, Ricky Leacock and Ed Pincus uh, from the line down at uh, MIT Film School. And uh, they were from the Cinema Verite School. I mean, I'm a big fan of the Maisel Brothers and uh, other famous and then Vermont, uh, there are some great filmmakers in Vermont, uh, starting with Nora Jacobson, who I worked with very closely uh, on the Vermont movie, but there are many others. But anyway, I'll keep it short. Yes? Yeah, my name is Fred, and Ray, my uh, question is on Boston. Was he your grandfather or great-grandfather that owned the Bruins? And was it the 20s or the 30s? Uh, it was my, uh, my grandfather that, uh, uh, he ran the Boston Garden, and he, he brought the Bruins into the Boston Garden, and he owned them, and then the, the In garden, the 20s and 30s. In the, thir in the 20s, in 1926. <sighs> he bought the, he bought the, there was a pro professional team in Boston Tigers. called the Tigers, and he bought the Tigers. And they had yellow and black striped uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> and that's why the Bruins have yellow and black striped uniforms. <laughs> <laughs> he just changed the name on the front of the yeah, shirt. Yeah. <laughs> and then it was his uncle who uh, started the uh, Celtics after his grandfather died. Yeah. That was his. He hired the first black basketball player. 
yeah. walk wow. around it. You got a little article of somebody, I mean, it was from the Boston Globe saying, well, what do you think? I mean, what are you thinking, basically? He, realized, <laughs> he said, I don't care if you purple polka dot it, he can put the ball in the net. <laughs> was the quote that was pretty sure. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. Yeah. Yeah. I should mention that uh, the, the dedication at the very end, um, his son Dylan and his older brother George died on the same night this past uh, December. Wow, so, wow. So that was after yeah. all the interviews, but mm. yet another uh, major crisis yeah. or setback yeah. that he's uh, <coughs> rebounded from. Yes. Hi, Ray. Um, so we've had this conversation before where I've told you you've been such an inspiration to me. Um, you got started painting a long time before I ever did. And I always look to you, maybe you'll teach me some shortcuts about ignoring outside critics. And, <laughs> and you have, so thank you for that. And Jody, thank you because you have an older partner who's had some health problems. And I've learned from you how to help my older partner. With you. <laughs> so that's been great. And I, I admire your honesty, both of you, in, in this presentation. And thank you, Matt, for, for sharing it all. Thank you. Okay. One last question.